um, it is, it's a great opportunity to be here and uh, firstly I'd like to congratulate all the men in the room. Thank you for coming along and the reason why is because this is about a conversation. It's more about a conversation than it is about anything else and uh, uh, you can't have a conversation about gender equity when you're only having that conversation with one part of that gender equation. So uh, when we get to 50% of the room being men and 50% of the room being women, when we're talking about these kind of issues, um, we'll be starting to make some inroads. So congratulations to those brave souls that are here today. To the rest of you, great for your interest as well. And when reflecting upon what I was going to talk about um, today, because my leadership journey has been quite an unusual one and there's been lots of twists and turns, as Elaine, Elaine said, lots and lots of ups and downs and uh, lots of big leaps forward and in particular lots of very, very steep learning curves. But I reflected on what is a good leader. Um, before I thought about what was a good women leader or male leader, what's a good leader? And of course inclusivity is part of that. The leaders that I reflected upon in, in, in my um, experience that are very good leaders are those that are inclusive. They're those that do look at diversity as being a, um, a benefit to the input to the process rather than um, a pain in the neck. Um, those that actually thought that the community was important in what they were doing were ones that actually were stronger leaders than others. And then I reflected upon, well, well what commenced me on a journey to be a leader? Did I wake up one morning and go, I'm going to be a leader and I'm going to try and be an inclusive leader, I'm going to do it? Well, not at all. But I grew up in a family where it was imperative um, on each and every one of us, um, drilled into us from a very young age, was to be the best that you possibly could and enable those around you to the, be the best that they possibly can. Which is the second part of it is probably more important than the first part. And when I reflected upon that, I thought, well, yes, you know, in everything that we did, for example, if I played sport, and I played lots of sport as a youngster, my mother encouraged us not just to play sport, to be involved in that sport, to be on the committees of those sports, to be umpires, to be the ones organising the food, the ones organising the, the, um, the carpooling and those sorts of things, to enable everyone else to be part of the process. I was also uh, lucky enough to be born with an innate sense of curiosity, and my favourite word as a youngster growing up was why. Why are we doing it this way? Why are we doing it that way? Why wouldn't we do it that way? And I just wanted to fix things. So as my leadership journey started at a very young age and that journey was about a sense of curiosity, a sense of fairness, a sense of actually ensuring that everyone around me could be the best that they could at the same time as me being the best that I could. It didn't mean I wasn't competitive. In fact, I was incredibly competitive amongst all of that. And my journey through uh, um, to the political um, sphere where I became a um, member for Chafee and a, a leader within the government through the ministerial positions of River Murray and Water was not one that was a calculated one. There was not a target set that I want to be a politician. There was not a target set that I wanted to be um, a leader, that I wanted to, to work in the water sector. But my journey was one of actually making decisions that saw opportunity. And every time I saw opportunity, I was brave enough to step through that door. And I didn't need to have all of the items on the list ticked to say I could do something. And for every one of you in this room, I know you all do it. You all look at a job opportunity and you go, oh, I've only got eight of those. I'll need the 10 before I can apply. And we all talk about this, but women do that all the time. Whereas men will go, oh, I've got one or two of them. <laughs> I'll give it a go. And, you know, that's exactly what you have to do. And, and as Grant said, you know, in his, his learning career, that was the biggest learning that Elaine had, um, was, was that where she only had two of the ten criteria. And she had to learn everything on the job. Being prepared and brave enough to do that is a sign of great leadership. And it's really difficult to do because you have to set aside your comfort zone. What will happen if it goes wrong? What will happen if this happens? What happens if that happens? And don't we overanalyze everything? Don't we analyze it to death? And then we don't make the step forward because we've talked ourselves out of it before we make that step forward. Do men do that in the workplace? Do they? Not really. Not to the same extent that women do. We also have the innate ability to care deeply, as do men, but women through nurturing and motherhood, 
care differently. And so we, we have a tendency to care about what the impacts will be on our family, what the impacts will be this, what the impacts will be on that, if we don't get it right. So in understanding that and understanding you know, what makes a great leader and how you aspire to a great leader, what makes a good inclusive leader was the next thing I thought about. And an inclusive leader actually understands all of that. An inclusive leader understands that uh, for cultural reasons, for age reasons, for gender reasons, for a range of different reasons, people have different views on the world. And that that is okay. One of the greatest failings in our political sphere at the moment is that everyone is pre-selecting people that are in their own likeness and they're afraid of diversity. They're afraid of the inclusiveness that that diversity brings to the decision making. They're afraid if they don't all think the same that that's death in politics. When in actual fact it's healthy that they don't all think the same. In fact, it's extraordinarily healthy. And I have to say to those four backbenchers in the political sphere here in South Australia who crossed the floor against their party were doing that brave thing. They were saying, I've got a different opinion. And in the past, that has been punished. It shouldn't be punished. It should be celebrated. It should be celebrated that that diversity brings broader thinking and greater I guess, more inclusive thinking around anything that you're doing. If you put it down to policy, where, you know, in the Department of in, uh, Environment and Water, there is strong emphasis on good policy. How are you going to get that good policy? You don't bring to that table that inclusivity. In my role as a politician, when I accidentally got pol um, elected to the, to the Parliament of South Australia, and I did actually get accidentally elected, I had no ambition to be a politician, I'd never been to Parliament House, and I'd never been a member of a political party. So getting accidentally elected in the second safest seat in the state with absolutely no chance of winning that seat, and a whole range of things led to that, not necessarily my activity in the election campaign, I just happened to be the right person in the right place who did I guess a number of things that struck a chord. Getting elected and then finding that I had to be a politician and learning what a politician did was a hugely steep learning curve. But in that hugely steep learning curve, throw into the fact that I became a mother for the first time and the first member of parliament in South Australia to, to give birth to a baby as a sitting member and then find out that I also had the balance of power. So you want a learning curve and that's a big learning curve. Did I have any of those boxes ticked to do that job before I stepped into it? Absolutely not. What I did have though was experience in leadership that was very inclusive and enabling those around me to be the best that they could. So I learned very quickly that I needed to make sure I surrounded myself with people who thought the same, that thought that their job was also to make others be able to be the best that they can. And in doing that, I thought to myself, I can't be an expert in anything. And I'm not an expert in anything. I didn't go to university. I have a similar story to Elaine, only I only made it to the end of the first term. <laughs> and I dropped out. And so I didn't have that, that uh, highly educated approach to things, but I had the, the, the approach to, to life of, of, of um, giving it a go and giving everything a go and learning on the job. So I didn't learn at university, but I learnt on the job. Through successive jobs, I moved through one thing to the next thing to the next thing. By the time I landed in politics, I had learnt very well that you didn't have to be an expert to be good at what you did. You just needed to know where the experts were. And there's plenty of people out there who are experts. And if you surround yourself with experts and diversity of opinion, you get a broader perspective. And having a broader perspective enables you to ask those questions that other people wouldn't normally ask. If you're locked into a very small and narrow trajectory in your thinking, you're not going to be able to have that inclusive thinking about, you, about what you do. And it goes with diversity, inclusivity, gender equity. They're all the same things. It's having that broad capability to look at things from a range of different perspectives that creates the environment for good leadership. Now in my ministerial office, um, we had gender balance, we had myself and mostly all women who came to the job because they were not from a, my political party or my political background. 
but who came to the job from all sorts of different work, walks of life. Some of them came out of agencies, but we had a balance of about 80% women and 20% men. And that wasn't by design, it was because that's just the way it happened. The people I were looking for that had, and the skills that I was looking for just happened to be women. I didn't have a, a gender balance required in my office, but in my electorate office, where I needed to be working with community, it was all women. We call ourselves the Chafee Chicks. Completely and utterly politically incorrect. But the Chafee Chicks are a great bunch of girls who still meet every six months. And we met last week again for our Christmas drinks. And what a team we became. But that team was their network, and their network was so diverse. Their network was not, we had age difference. We had, we had a young trainee um, who, uh, is, uh, um, who made herself a job. We didn't have a trainee in our office. She came along and said, you need a trainee. We said, well, we're a little bit busy. We know we can have one, but, you know, well, I'm going to tell you how you can have a trainee, and I'm your trainee. And she actually created her own job. Really interesting girl. She got that job, and she's a, she's a very successful young lady, as you can imagine. The others were I had a, 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 the diversity in a, a, an older lady who has been on boards and worked in the health sector. I had another person from the banking sector. I had another person who was off the land, and her and her husband managed properties together. And then we had someone else who worked in natural resource management. And so we had a diverse range of backgrounds and we had a diverse range of, of, um, of um, ages. We didn't have a diverse range of gender. <laughs> and I, I've often reflected upon that and saying, well, did I have an unconscious bias when I was employing? I probably did. And that unconscious bias led to, to the group that I had in my office being very constructive but I also then used to think, well, what am I missing if I've got all women in my office? Where am I going to get the other perspective from? And so we set up a range of, 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 of groups within the community that included all men groups, mixed groups, and uh, young groups and old groups that fed into what we were doing. So being part of the inclusive leadership was about accessing that um, diversity that I didn't have in my actual um, you know, immediate vicinity within my office. I guess um, in, in, in closing my remarks, um, the things that I look back in regard to my, um, my leadership roles over the years, the, the things that stick in my mind most are, you are generally your own worst enemy when it comes to these issues, whether you're a man or a woman. And that if you look to change, look to change yourself first. And don't look critically upon others for the way they act. Show others respect for their opinion. You don't have to agree with it. But it's critically important to respect that they are entitled to have that opinion, as misinformed as it may be. And in politics, that's critically important. Because that ability to be able to acknowledge that it's okay for people to have differing opinions, and it's even okay for them to be not necessarily as flexible in the way that they think about things. Because that's their product of their environment. And most often you are not going to change them. But if you want to change what's happening around you, is you have to actually learn to find a way around them, through them, over them. Or look at how you can actually manage that particular attitude in your environment and your work. If you can't, leave it and go and find somewhere where you can work in that productive environment. And I believe in that firmly because you can do everything that you can to try and make change in certain circumstances, but sometimes it's just not going to be possible. So the answer is to go sideways and up or around or over and then continue your good work positively and reflect upon what it was that happened in that particular environment that caused you not to be able to make a positive change and learn from it. Don't blame them. Just accept that they're an immovable object because there are plenty of them out there. And if you spend and waste all of your time on immovable objects, the momentum towards change will be inhibited. 
So in closing my, my uh, words of wisdom from the, uh, the wild, uh, wise speakers, uh, wise leaders, is, is to, to remain positive and true to yourself in all things, to actually continue the conversation that we've all been talking about here and continue the conversation positively and respectfully. Identifying immovable objects and don't waste your time on them. Surround yourself with positive, good people and create the energy for change with those people. Thank you. Thank you.